you know, we don't talk a lot about fear in our work. We talk about doing the work and we talk about typography and color and concepts and so forth, but we never really talk about um, one of the things that kind of gets in front of all of us, and that is fear. It's, there, there's something about creativity and the unknown and problem solving that can somehow, you know, bring fear to the forefront, even though we don't, we're not really aware of it but it's, it's there. And, and, and fear in our work, can, it, it shows itself in, in, turn, in, in ways of trepidation. It can cause us to be sort of over careful with the way we think about things. It can cause us to be very risk averse. Um, and, and, and in some cases, like this drawing, it can be paralyzing. It can be really paralyzing. And, and you know, I've been practicing design for around 40 years and it, it crops up more often than, than not. It doesn't necessarily go away, but there are ways to there are ways to beat fear. And so I'm gonna talk about that because I, I know that you're all aware of it. Um, and we all experience it at one time or another. And sometimes we experience it a lot and it, and it really gets in the way and we're not sure, you know, sort of how to fight it. And I wanna talk about that. The opposite of fear is confidence and, and Really what I ultimately want to talk about is how to gain confidence and confidence in our work and how to think about design. And, and, and confidence comes with time and it comes with practice and it comes with knowledge and, and ultimately it becomes part of us trusting ourselves. And so if we can take fear out of the equation, you, we can watch confidence um, start to come forward. So let's walk through this a little bit. Let's, let's see if we can understand fear from one way of looking at fear and one way that we all think about it. This is what I call the fear method. So think about this as a way to solve a problem and see if this is very familiar to you. Um, we sit down to do to take on an assignment and we get an initial idea. Boom, comes to us. We sketch it out, comes to us in our head. Maybe we don't even sketch it out. And we get so excited um, that we just figured out the hard part of that we already have the idea, right? And we jump onto the computer and start to build it. We instantly, we're suddenly on the computer and we're building out our design. Um, and lo and behold, we've spent out, we suddenly start spending hours massaging a single idea, that idea that we thought was the one. Uh, we try different type and different illustration styles and different colors and keep pushing things around. And what's happening is we're just kind of moving the players on the field in one or the, you know, the chairs on the deck in one single idea. And if that isn't a great idea, all we're doing is just pushing some things around and trying to, to, to make it be a good idea. And what, what then starts to happen, things aren't working out. So we try harder to push the same rock up the hill. We just keep pushing harder. And we think if I keep working on this harder because hard work pays, right? It will become a good idea. But the truth is it may not be that good of an idea. And we'll, see, we'll look at why that happens. So what's happening is we start to get discouraged um, because what happens, we're not actually working on the problem we're trying to keep from failing. <laughs> we, we start to get this sense that this may not work out. And then what happens is we're a failure. You know, we failed at this design thing. Um, and that becomes present. It's not as obvious as, as me talking about right now, but it's there, believe me. It's starting to tell us we might fail at this. Then what are we gonna do? So what happens there is fear takes over. And I know this happens, you know, in, in the case of being a student, you've got a deadline, you've got something due, you have time, you only have so much time in your schedules to afford doing a project. So you start going, have I wasted time on this? Well, I might have, but it's too late to start over. And this is never going to work out. So suddenly, you know, fear has won. Fear has basically taken over. Fear wins. I suck. I'm not a good designer. Okay. And this is a scenario that, that happens time and again and can happen throughout a career if we don't get a hold of it. 
it's it's where we're operating in a mode whereby we're governed by the successes that we think we see on our page or not. And when they don't happen, we start to have fret and, and fear starts to sort of erode the process. And we don't necessarily know this is happening when it's happening. Um, but it's it's a method that happens when, when you go all the way back to the, the the problem here is getting an initial idea that very often we jump in too fast okay and we start working on something and we we rush to the computer and we start to try to build it and the fact is we haven't really we haven't really addressed the problem okay and so that turns into fear of failing so where do we go from there how does our initial excitement about a project turn and become fear well it's because we're avoiding the truth and the truth is that solutions are really a mystery until we uncover them. The absence of a method to discover it, we operate in fear that we will never find it. Okay, we fear that failure is sort of imminent. And and this this happens when you're young in design, and believe me, it happens when you're older and experienced in design. It's it's it happens from being hasty, from starting to go, I think I can get this. If I can just get on the computer, it's going to look great. And we get on there and lo and behold, it doesn't look great. And heaven forbid, if you go to your first crit and you find out, well, this isn't even on base. You're not even on, you're not even tracking, right? So now you're starting to really, really fret and worry. And that's, that's anxiety. And those things start to contribute to the way that we work. And so what I want to talk about is how to avoid that and how to keep from letting that contaminate our process. Newsflash, we all aren't very good at one time or another, but it's just, it's just the way it is. It's part of the process and it's not a permanent condition, okay? <laughs> there are days when, when I really wonder what it is that I'm doing and if like I had the last good idea last week, and I'm sure you guys have this too, um, it does go away and you can come back and you know uh, be a viable contributor to the, in the world of ideas. Um, so here's the solution. This is what we're going to talk about today is that if we develop the right habits, there's a way to prevent fear from contaminating our process. So I'm going to talk about this and, and, and by the way, I'm happy to forward this PDF to you guys later. So you don't have to write all this down if you don't want to. So I'm going to call this the patient method. And Imagine you get your first assignment, you get it the first day in class. Um, don't start designing, start asking questions. Let's frame the assignment. And if Hank or any of these teachers haven't given you enough criteria, they haven't given you enough, um, uh, not directives, but, but criteria from which you have to work against, ask some questions, get the criteria. Because design is about solving particular problems it's not about working off of our whims it's 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 taking a problem that needs to be addressed and fixing it so if you, it's not clear what the problem is let's ask let's ask for it okay and i suspect that that, that hank and his team give you pretty defined problems but um, like any even good clients don't give you a full definition and so so let's ask a lot of questions before we get started make sure that we have it really framed up and then we got to start sketching the news for you. Don't go to your computer. Um, get out some paper and pencil, pen, whatever instrument you want to write on. But I want you to sketch. We have to sketch. And, and the way I want to think about sketching is that it's that you're not trying to solve the problem. You're just trying to, to, to probe. OK, and this is a different mindset, because if we try to solve the problem, it's hard to do that in one sketch. But if you think we're just trying to work around and you go, what about this? What about this, that? You try to find a way in. You're trying to find some kind of a path into what might open up to be a solution, okay? And the last I say, defer judgment. What I mean by that is don't judge your sketches when you're making them. Just keep sketching. Just keep sketching, keep moving. And 
And you will find what happens is that those sketches start to propagate other sketches. And then you start to have little collisions of ideas like, well, that looks like that works, that looks there. And so we work quickly and, and like I say, small because you're just trying to, trying to telegraph ideas. I often worry about things when, you know, we think about problems not always at our drawing board. We think about them when we're on the way to class, we think of them when we're going to the store, we think about them over dinner. And so I try to keep a sketchbook nearby and I always think about this idea is that I don't want the idea to get away um, because ideas are fleeting. They come in and they go. And so um, one of the things I used to do when I used to commute is I had a little recorder in my car and I would, I'd, you know, talk to myself. I'd say, well, no, it's the, the, the trademark looks like this. It's a silhouette and then there's a, the negative shape is this and such, and it's gonna look like this. So I'd, I'd start to imagine things and then tell myself it. So when I get in, I drop, drop that down. So we wanna try to try to capture ideas before they can get away. Um, so again, sketch, 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 sketch. Don't stop until you're, until you're done. Okay. So again, and it's kind of what I was saying here is that the sketching is about investigation. It's not about rendering a solution at the moment. Okay? You have to think about it that you're investigating, you're looking for something because that is gonna be the backbone of the design. And if you don't have it, then what I say is you're either super human or you're really lucky because if you, if you haven't sketched out an idea, it's really unlikely you're gonna have a really, really solid solution once you get on the computer. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, you, you can, like I said, if you get lucky, but um, I know for myself, if I get on the computer too soon and start trying to hammer something out, it shows itself. It's like, I need to go back and think about this some more. So it's, it's, it's a fundamental front end process. It, it is the hard work of design. Sorry to say, it is the hard work. The easy work is working out the type solutions, the color and stuff. That's much easier. Make a lot of options, okay? And and one of the things, and this goes for illustration or design, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, is to try to come up with an idea that, that seems to make relatively good sense. Maybe it's commonplace, it's like, oh, that's obvious. That's an apple, that should be an apple, that's good. And then once you've got that done, go and try to think of something that's really far away from that. It's really different and it's really unexpected. And, and I say the term, learn to surprise yourself because once you've done this, you will be amazed at how easy it is to do again. Because you go, okay, I have the security of that. That's a, that, I'm pretty sure that's a solid solution for the problem. Let's kind of put that over there and let's see if I can come up with another one that's maybe way farther out. And you, and you give those things a day sometimes and you look at me and go, that's actually a really good solution. And it will start to develop our mind into thinking alternatively. So we're like when I'm doing illustration, I will always give a client two or three sketches. They are rock solid. But sometimes I'll take one that's, I'll throw one in that's just way, way out there. Um, not knowing if it's, if it's quite in their wheelhouse, um, but I'm going to say 75% of the time we use it. And as a way of habit, once you start doing that, you start to develop sort of an, 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 an affection, an inclination to do that kind of less usual work. And your own standard of what is acceptable starts to excel. Okay. Um, I think I've already said this, but I'll say it one more time. Don't use the computer to prove something that works or really sucks, okay? Don't have an idea and say, I'm gonna put this on the computer and see if I can prove it works or not. I mean, it, that is a method, it, you can do that, but in terms of efficiency, it's better to, as Bruce Mao says, um, sketching is cheap and efficient. It's the most efficient way of thinking because you can, you can develop a lot of ideas quickly and you don't, you don't burn a lot of calories, if you will, at least a lot of time. But what we wanna do is develop a discerning eye where we can look at our, the shorthand in our sketches and say, that has promise, I, I can develop that. Or that isn't a very good idea, let's move on.
So it's, it's, and that's, again, this is out of practice. Once we've done this a lot of times, we start to understand, okay, I, I can see promise in that. I can see promise in that work. And I'm sure that you watch Hank and you watch your instructors walk up and they go, that's a winner. That has good promise. That's because they developed the discerning eye. And we have to do that with our own work. Big time saver. Okay. Lastly, before you go to the computer, evaluate your idea. Do you have enough to execute on? Is this the foundation or everything? This is going to be the foundation, by the way, of the design. So don't say, well, no, I'm going to get to that on the computer. I'll work it out. No, figure out where, what do you want to do with your type? What's the big idea? What's the visual? What's the big visual? What's the scaling like? Get a sense of how it's going to be before you go on the computer. Um, and you can do it on pencil and paper. And, and because the computer is deceptive, it makes stuff look a lot better than it is. Um, it looks good on the computer and then you print it out and you go, well, I really didn't have my, I didn't have my proportions worked out. Um, and, and the last thing I say there is you can't shore up a weak foundation. It's, it's like if this thing really doesn't have a good core DNA, all the massaging on the computer is not going to get it there. It's just not going to be there. And that's when that fear can start to creep in. If you start to realize, got all this work in, now I'm starting to feel a sense of failure. If you do what I'm describing here, you go through this method, that fear doesn't pop in there. You're excited. You're excited about your work. Lastly, um, you will start to notice you're not operating against fear. We're excited about what we're making. Okay, you're excited about what you're making and we don't suck. Okay, we're pretty good. So the idea is when you leave your sketchbook with your sketches, you have a decent idea where you're going with it. Then the playing begins. We're starting to develop a type, we're starting to work on the illustration and we're gonna take photographs, whatever. That's when the fun begins. And those become design decisions, but they're not necessarily high level conceptual decisions. Makes sense? I can only see a few of you, so I'm not if that makes sense. <laughs> so what I want to do now is I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a couple little projects and show you how I work. Um, I have three or four sketchbooks going at any given time. And I have sketchbooks over the years that I've kept, and I have design projects in there, I have doctor's notes, I have books I want to write, I have movies I want to see, all that stuff is mixed in and they're not precious. My sketchbooks aren't precious. This is a project here obviously with a stamp or something, but that's what they look like. I work really small with little thumbnails. The bigger the sketch, the more graphite you use, the more drawing you have to do. The smaller the sketch, the more condensed, the more compressed the idea is. Look at this. this this little sketch here, let's see if I can blow this up. You know, that's all of an inch square. Looks like there's an earth within an eye with a tear. You know, there's probably two dozen sketches here, two dozen ideas. Not necessarily all of them good. I also work on tissue paper. Um, for my illustration work, I'll start a lot of times in a sketchbook and then I go to drawing vellum and that's because I'm tracing over it. Once I find an idea I like, I will then begin to work on it. Um, tracing is a good thing and I don't know anybody that doesn't work on tissue. If you try to redraw something every time on, you know, bond paper or sketch paper, it's, you're wasting time. Tissue is, is, is the friend to, it's, it's, it's iterative. Um, I wrote this a time before and I like this idea that if, that if we don't really do enough sketching, it's like getting off the freeway too early in a trip, you really don't know what you've missed. So it's good to like circle the planet with the project, feel like you've seen all the exits and then you go, okay, I'm gonna take this one. So um, we always wanna feel like we've kind of exhausted the possibilities. So let's look at some projects. Um, <clears throat> this was for the Postal Service in 2003. It was my very first stamp I did for them. Um, and the idea, this was well before we had all these California wildfires. 
was a, a stamp about stopping wildfires. They didn't really give me the copy. I was able to write the copy and do the illustrations. So here's a page in a sketchbook for me. Now there's a couple things you can notice. I'm, I take notes because it's a shorthand. I'm not sure what I was thinking at the time, but I want to remind myself when I look at this the next day, because you're trying to, if this is really working, by the way, if you're sketching like this, you're in a zone. You're starting to get out of your own consciousness, if you will. I mean, you're working, there's a flow happening here. And when it's working, sometimes it's hard to remember what you were thinking at the time. So you take notes, I take notes. <clears throat> more sketches again same same notion and i don't expect that you all would understand these necessarily but i do because it's a language it's a vocabulary that i speak so i understand what i'm right what i'm drawing here i want well enough to develop it if you will so this is what they look like when i do i i pick you know in this case i probably picked five or six that i'm going to show them there's not one solution for a stamp there's the whole bunch of them and so I want to give them an opportunity, the Postal Service, to sort of evaluate, you know, where I was weighing in on this. So this sketch is enough information for me. The big idea was the that the, the match head was going to be the trunk of the tree. And in this case, we're basically saying, but there's, this is all by implication. Just put the word stop. Don't be careless. Um, here was the idea on the left side was that you'd have this this incredible landscape on the top and the bottom was going to be a reflection of fire so this like saying this could happen if we don't protect this um, again this is all by inference so I'm trying to tell a story here that makes you ask the questions as a reader but that sketch was enough for me to develop this from. So here's one I, I drew, and I, look at my notes here. Cut loosely, Rand. So this is reference to Paul Rand. So make sure that, you know, I'm a big fan of Paul Rand, so this is where I'm going like, remember how Paul does stuff? Paul does stuff like he's, you know, drawing with his wrong hand. His stuff is really rough, and so that's what I'm telling myself. So when I get around to this one, I go, okay, 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 Paul Rand, right. Channel Paul Rand. That's what that sketch looks like. Look out for wildfires. So the notion on this one was like, oh, what if I can do this sort of this faux fire happening to the stamp itself? And you may not be able to tell that enough from that stamp sketch but i can i can remember that so that's what i did here so i actually lit something on fire and scanned it and built it from there the idea here in my mind was that i'm going to have this massive landscape with these teeny teeny little fires you see in the distance I think this is the last one. I'll let you all look at this for one second and see if you can see where this is gonna go. See if my shorthand is, is, is communicating. So what I was trying to do was going, can you, Craig, there's a similarity between you know, pine trees and the shape of a flame. So if I can make those two look like one becomes the other, then we start to see the potential, the danger. We start to see the tragedy, if you will. And those are the identical shape. This just has a stem and the color is different. The one on the left is wild, the one on the right is fire. One of my very favorite stamps, and this story has a terrible ending because they've never produced this stamp. <laughs> it's not that they didn't, I, it's not that they didn't like them. 
they just, they abandoned the idea of making a wildfire stamp. And because I've done so many stamps since then, I communicate with the Postal Service and I keep submitting this every year going, you know, you see what's happening to California? Can we finally do a, a wildfire stamp? And they still haven't done it, but you know, these aren't dead. They have them and you can see it. You can see by the, the denomination, 37 cents. I think a stamp is 44 now. So this was some time ago. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Hank, am I supposed to respond to chats? I see chatting here. People asking me things. Is Hank there? We're just admiring uh, your work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it's a specific question, if it's a specific question, you're welcome to answer. But oftentimes it's just them talking between themselves going, oh, cool. wow, I love this. And... Okay, cool. Hi, Pippa. Okay, so I'm back on, I guess. Um, this was a town cutler was, was a young chef that left the uh, fine dining world to become a knife purveyor, which is he wanted to make really fine chef's knives. And he wanted to call himself Town Cutler here in San Francisco. <clears throat> he was a friend of my son's. My son worked with him in a restaurant and his name is Galen. And he he decided to leave the business of cooking, but he 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 knew the world of 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 chefdom, if you will. And so he wanted to make knives that 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 spoke to that particular audience. And so he came to me and said, you know, can you make me a logo? I'm gonna be called Town Cutler and I wanna make cool knives and I have cool clientele and, you know, they're gonna be expensive and all those things. And, but but he didn't really have a company yet. He was brand new. So to me, it was a very exciting project. He had a lot of energy. He was just a great guy. We're still friends. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to say, look, the world is vast for you right now. You got a brand new business. You can, anything you want. You know, you've already got a nice name. Um, let's just feel, see what that would look like. So I start sketching on this. And in my sketchbook, see, I like to populate one whole page spread, just fill it with little ideas because these things start to inform each other. They start to just, you know, sort of talk to each other. Nothing's precious. And, and right there is maybe, you know, 10 decent ideas. So <clears throat> I would take these and I'll get it to this stage. And maybe this took me, you know, a few days. I might come back and keep sketching in it. Um, I'm not sitting down in an hour and trying to solve this problem. You know, I might get a few done and then I'll go and do something else. And come back at it with fresh eyes and say, what, what's interesting in there? <clears throat> so from there, I mean, you can, you can kind of look at these. This is kind of a, you know, pirate tattoo-y looking classic cigar box genre. You know, it's, it has a lot, of, a lot going for it, I think. This is just kind of cool. It's just this knife standing on end. I mean, this is a pretty unavoidable one. I mean, it's a town cutler, they sell knives. So you, you know, you're not gonna put a spoon on this. They do sell spoons, but they don't sell, you know, they're about knives. So this was, this was, you know, to me, it's gold, it starts with gold because it's such a wonderful icon to begin with. Here's a typographic connection. It's like, what if you run that knife right through the type? What if you, what if you make this intersection? Now, that idea took me you know, probably all of three minutes to draw. If you went to the computer and tried to construct that, you'd spend at least an hour, at least. You'd be into Illustrator, you'd have to pick the type font, you'd have to draw the knife, and then you might get done and go, that sucks, you know? And I spent a whole bunch of time on it. Um, where here, I can look at it and go, I know that I want that to be a big serif type face, and then Cutler's gonna be secondary and it's going to be spaced out you know and i can look at it and evaluate so, yeah it's pretty good the bottom one is a like a monogram here i was drawing a, a chef sharpening um, as it turns out really really good chefs don't use they use sharpening stones they don't use 
the sharpening stick, whatever it is. <clears throat> so we didn't do that. Here's an idea of just this knife sort of penetrating the paper. with the type in between. So I take those and I decide to build them out because I'm gonna show them to the, these to him finished because he's young and he's young in the design business. I thought I'm not gonna make him try to look at my sketches and try to decide if those are any good because he may, he may not like something because it was drawn crudely. So I'm gonna only execute things that I think are promising. So you can see I've already developed somewhat of a color palette Typography, they're all kind of similar. I mean, I love the economy of something like this when you start to put everything within the form. And this is the one he picks. Um, it just uses a very classic uh, Garman typography. So that this kind of roots it in a classic, it's somewhat contemporary, but it's still very, very elegant. Obviously I abandoned these brackets, but there's the idea. I mean, that's not a, that's not a far reach. And this is what it looks like. And, you know, we letter press the business cards. We, um, he etched it. It had to be able to work on a knife, so it's etched into knives. He made a rubber stamp. <clears throat> he has a store in Chicago, and <laughs> this rarely happens when the client just does such a great job with a logo. They usually mess it up. Um, he didn't ask me about this. He went out and got this sign made and sent it to me, and I thought it was so beautiful. He, how smart is that? He just cut the, he just cut the uh, the knife right out of the steel, and um, it's just so elegant looking and just gorgeous. It looks great on his, in the his uh, employees wear their shirts with, that where they make the knives. So, <clears throat> you know, we established a relationship. This was many years ago, and then probably two or three years ago, he said, I'd like to do some kind of a catalog or a newsletter or something. And I said, well, let's, let's do like a big newspaper. You know, let's design you a newspaper and you can talk about what it's like to, you know, make fine knives and how you make choices about knives and how you, you can educate people about knives. And so I know it's going to be a big tabloid, but this is what I never went to the computer. I sketched out essentially a storyboard. I write out what's going to be on every spread and i drew it out pretty tightly pretty it's a pretty good road i think of it as a road map okay now i haven't worried i haven't thought about typography short of this really big c-u-t-l-e-r i don't really know what this typography is going to be yet but i don't really care you know what i mean it's not i don't mean that i don't care in the long run but i don't care at this moment it's it's not critical to where this thing goes. So we know that I'm gonna do an exploded view of the knife. I'm gonna talk about how the knife is being made. This is showing a bunch of actual knives. This is the foods that they apply to. So this is just describing the story we wanna tell. And what's, 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 valuable about working this way is that we haven't invested a tremendous amount of time. I mean, I've got some a couple of days in this, but it's not a lot of time before he sees it and gets to approve it. And once a client is bought in at this kind of stage, you've gained their trust. Now I go and start to you know, build these out. And this is what they start to look like. That's the cover. Is that me? Okay, so there's that spread with the with the illust the exploded view. These are all the processes. This is how you make a knife. There's the one of all the. And the idea was that every knife is coded. There's five different kinds of knives, 
comes down to five essential knives, no matter how you cut it. And this is these are the this is where you use those knives. This is my illustration. This is actually my illustration too. It's not a style I work in, but I, I know how to do it. <clears throat> um, this is a poster for the same guy or the same company when they had a one year anniversary. The chef businesses, the cooking businesses, there's a little creepy factor to it and it's okay. It's His clientele loved this. So the last part of the story, so this is how sketchbooks work. This is a sketch that I happened to do one Halloween in my sketchbook. And um, it just it was just for whatever. And I showed it to my client, to Galen. This is well after we've done logos and stuff. I showed it to him. He said, boy, that's really great. And the next time I saw him, he said, I just got it tattooed on my side. <laughs> Ultimate compliment. <clears throat> that's disturbing. Um, Fillmore Jazz Festival. This is the second poster I'd done for them. This is, this is a jazz festival that they hold in San Francisco, 2015. Same old routine for me. Um, lots of notes, quick ideas. You know, jazz is very often symbolized with a saxophone, often with guitars. Saxophone is the most used, I think. Um, Stand-up bass is another one. I mean, this is an outdoor jazz festival. It's in San Francisco, so there's there's myriad icons I can use. It's outdoors. It's beautiful. It's San Francisco. It's 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 happening. It's jazz, you know. So the the, the criteria is really wide open. cut paper different colors. So what I was imagining was that I would do this drawing of a silhouette of a guy playing saxophone, like Xerox that are printed on several different cuts of pieces of paper and then cut them apart and then photograph it. I didn't do that and I wish I had now. I, I really would love to see how that works out. <clears throat> An ear chair, you know, those classic sort of club bar chairs that with the bent wood in the shape of an ear. Just a cool, this is just, you know, jazz is cool. So this is just a hat hanging on a base. This is just a beautiful poster. That's my idea. That would be beautiful. Again, further abstracting, just look at the top of the, of the, uh, the base instrument with the outdoors and the birds. But I got stuck on this guy playing the bass out, you know, standing out, this cool cat. And I just thought there's something about that that's interesting. And if you see what I'm doing is I'm cropping it. I'm I'm think, saying, well, I don't I don't want the rest of the bass. I don't want his legs. I just want this action going on here. So I decided this was the one I wanted to develop. And so I took that idea and I drew it. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, but I, I started abstracting it farther. I thought, well, it's too much information. It's too much just a drawing of a guy. So how, what if I strip some stuff down? So he's got his sunglasses. And then the, the strings on his base are the same as the lines on his vest. So there's something kind of cool about that. So I kept looking at that and going, well, what if I render it more, render him more? What does that look like? You know, things about um, jazz festivals or any, you know, concert event is people like to collect those posters. So, you know, I always like to think about this is going to be a collector piece. Somebody's going to, you know, want to frame this later on. So, I'm not very happy with these and I don't know why. I just, I'm thinking these just, it just doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere for me. And in many ways i'm 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 demonstrating what i was telling you we all do you sometimes you get something way down the road and it's like Meh, maybe it wasn't such a great idea and um i mean i think it's an okay poster but it's not great 
So I went back and looked at the sketches again. I saw this little one, this little teeny sketch, and it said discord and dissonance, because jazz is about, is about dissonance. It's about everything not being jiving together harmonically. Um, I'm not a real jazz aficionado, so I may not be describing that right, but there's something that there's, there's something, there's an energy about jazz that I was not capturing in this. This has no energy to it whatsoever. It's just dead. So I, I looked at the sketch and then I, then I remembered a sketch that I had done in my sketchbook years before. And I had just done this in a sketch. I was just thinking, it wasn't for an assignment. It was just sitting dormant. And I went back to that sketch and I said, I can make that into a poster. And so I redrew that and produced that poster. Now that has a whole lot different vibe than that. <laughs> you know, one is very pleasant, um, but I want to go to that event. I want to be there. <clears throat> and there's the germ for that right there. All right. We'll do one more of these. Let's see. How are we do on time, Hank? Should you want to do questions or you want to keep going? Okay. Let's do one more of these. Then we're going to do some questions. This is a, a gentleman wrote this book um, called Think Simple. And he had originally written a book um, called Insanely, Insanely Simple, Insanely Smart, uh, Steve Jobs' line. It was a book about Steve Jobs. He was the ex art uh, creative director for Chiat Day. And so he wanted to write this book about business leaders. He had suddenly had access because of his first book to all these business leaders that were able to deal with complexity and chaos in, the, in their companies and deal with it via simplicity. So he had a book, his title is called Think Simple, How Smart Leaders Defeat Complexity. Um, seems pretty easy, except he's already kind of solved it because he named it Think Simple. So that made the subject, that made the, that made the visual a little bit tough, I thought. So <clears throat> what does it mean to think simple? I don't know. Um, and there's a book cover, so it's gotta have, it's gonna have to have presence, right? So, I'm just meandering around here. I mean, a thimble is so simple. It's such a beautiful piece of design. So is a pylon, so is a push pin. And I'm not evaluating, I'm just looking through these. Okay, I'm just trying to jot down ideas. It's a brain thing. He's holding an arrow, a stump. There's a pencil, it says, think simple. Just meandering, right? Look at this guy coming from chaos to simplicity. He's coming through the simplicity wall. <clears throat> so I generate a bunch of these. And then I thought, well, now I've got to see if these are going to fly on a cover. So I, you know, clients that come to me, if they get, if I'm excited about a project, they get their money's worth because I don't just give them one solution. I'm going to give them a bunch of solutions, a bunch of ideas. I mean, these are ultimately, it should be hard for a client to pick. I want them to have go, these are all good. What's the very best one? So I decided to build a lot of these, do those, you know, big versions of those little sketches. Look at this. He's, he's thinking something and he's getting one in his hand. I don't know quite what that means, but it's pretty interesting. Here's a pencil out of a stump. <clears throat> Look at this, he's, he's won the prize. He's, he's sitting on his solution, holding his solution. Okay, so I start to develop these. And this is where 
you take the visual and then I'm starting to play with type. There's lots of type possibilities. This says Helvetica all over. For one thing, he's a he's a Jobs, he's a Steve Jobs fan. You got to use Helvetica. Um, insanely simple. That was the first book. Not bad. I mean, they're kind of interesting. So that kind of led me down the road. So what happens once I build one of these, I may not have had the sketch of what I'm about to show you, but this triggers another thought when I get to that stage. I go, well, what if he's on a stack of pieces and he's showing that he's he's arrived at the positive solution? Arrow meaning good, up, winner. And then that one led to, well, what if you break that down into a, you know, again, think Paul Rand or think, yeah, Paul Rand. That's pretty simple. <clears throat> this is, a, sometimes I'll experiment with something executionally. It's like, well, I can draw that in Illustrator. I can draw that thing really fast and it's going to look really cold and really boring. So what if I just cut it out of paper and throw it down and shoot a picture of it with my iPhone? And and a lot like sketching, it's it's working so fast that you're not allowing yourself to judge it. I can make that and look at it and go, that sucks, but it only took me 10 minutes to make. Okay. It could also be fantastic. So these are the risks. I mean this idea that if fear was in there if I was worried about failing I would never even do this but I don't think about that I'm just thinking about I'm thinking about I'm excited I'm thinking about enthusiastic enthusiasm and how this is going to work well <clears throat> I love this idea of the stump that had been whittled down to a tree I don't think it's a very good eco message these days but you know the pencil is that is the is the icon for thinking and this is the idea of sort of whittling something down to its bare essential. I like this a lot, but the drawing dates it to me. It feels a little bit sort of old. There's the human and, and, and you see this stuff coming in and then it's, it's complex inside. I'm not quite sure what this all means, to be honest with you. Um, but it's sure engaging. It's a strong cover. And then there's this, which was kind of a weird idea. It's like if you dismantle a pencil or a pencil arrives, is grown out of this spaghetti. Wow. It's kind of magical. So then I presented them to him this way. We actually, I built the books and we photographed them and so forth. And you can see there's just lots of them. And there's this one that you just saw. And that's what he picked. And that's, there's the sketch. Um, so the message here is, is, you know, if you do these sketches, this stuff can get born. If you don't do that sketch, this can never bo get born. It's like Hank said, if you don't enter, you can't win. You know, you, you have to, you have to do this first. Now I improved it a lot. I mean, I built on it, but the core idea is that the, the three visual members of a pencil from any, from one side turn into these three dimensional sort of spaghettis. It's so unusual and it's so simple. So, I guess I do have one more. I'll do a quickie. This is just an illustration assignment. So this is, this is not design, this is my day job as an illustrator. So Trust Magazine, this is a magazine out of Scotland, financial firm. <clears throat> I'm gonna move swiftly because I wanna get to questions. Um, yeah, I don't want to explain this. Purpose, not governance. It's complicated. So let's just move the sketches. This is typical for me. I will print out the manuscript 
and as I read it, I make sketches. So I'm sketching on the manuscript. Um, and I find that's super helpful. Take the creative brief and just draw on it while you're reading it. Lots of little sketches. These clients never gonna see these. <clears throat> then I take those and go to a tissue and I start making those. And you see, I put these little X's over. These are pretty good. These are pretty good. These are pretty good. And from there, I'm gonna do a tighter sketch and show it to the client. So the client's gonna see, look at these. These are really rough. But that's the core idea, bird flying out of man's vest. There's that pencil idea again. So this is how I tie it. I show, this is what I show a client for illustration. I'll do a tight version. In this case, I do them in two tones just because it helps read them a little bit. And then I've found, found passages within the text that support my visual. So I'm selling I'm selling these hard. I'm saying this thing means this. <laughs> and they love this. They love this because it gives them context for my thinking. Keep in mind, I'm, they only got to buy like two of these. So I'm giving them like six or eight. So I'm trying to bury them with possibilities. Strange idea. Love this idea. So there's four, there's 11 sketches of which I think they're using three or four. And I found that if client says, you know, you're not there, these are all good. They're just, they have variation. It's, it's something they love and it frees me up because I don't feel like I have to make one solution. I have to make several good possibilities and we'll get there. We'll pick one eventually. So these are what the finish looked like. They did go with the one with the bird. There's the compressed earth under duress. It's about Tesla's turn the automobile industry in an increasingly sustainable direction. I didn't want to draw a Tesla. That's, it'd be boring. So I drew a new, a new world, a new environment. And there's the cover. And there's the sketch. So this was about without borders. This is like exceeding the constraints of the trellis. And that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be one of the admissions advisors helping you guys to start your creative careers here with the Miami Ad School with our four portfolio programs, art direction, copywriting, photography and video and design, as well as our boot camps. We are well equipped to make you well equipped for the creative industry. And my job is to help you transition smoothly from prospective to enrolled student. We have financial aid and scholarships available for all of our portfolio programs and our four U.S. locations, Miami, Atlanta, San Francisco, and New York, as well as our international locations are ready for you guys to go ahead and enroll when you are ready. So feel free to go to our website, www.miamiadschool.com, hit apply now, start your application, and if you have any questions, set up a call, and we will be happy to help you.